Hello and welcome to the Bureau Asia podcast. I'm Matt Cowan, the Bureau Chief and your host. Thank you for listening in. It's been a while. It's been something like two months since our last episode. It's incredible how time flies and how quickly you drop out of the podcast charts. Although I noticed yesterday that we're still in the top 100 of the travel and places in Vietnam list on the Apple podcast charts. So that's pretty good. Be sure to give this one a share once you've listened. A lot of things have happened in Vietnam and the region since our last one, which we're going to sink our teeth into in a moment. Usually at this point, I'd recap the previous episode, but to be honest, I can't remember what it was about. So how about I just tell you what's coming up instead? In the first half of the episode, we're going to take a look at what's been making news here in Vietnam. There's been all sorts of juicy stuff. Then after that, we're going to introduce you to the darkest side of Vietnam with five locations in Saigon where some pretty dark shit has happened in the past and that you might want to check out next time you're visiting our great city. Just in case you're tired of having fun and want to feel depressed, we've got you covered. In fact, I'm kind of cheating with that segment because I'd planned to publish a YouTube video on the Bureau Asia channel this week called The Dark Side of Saigon You've Never Seen. But I've had a rethink and the day I uploaded it, in fact, just hours afterwards, I decided not to publish it and we'll discuss the reasons for it in a bit. So hang around for that. Okay, so that's about it. Let's get into this thing. Okay, so we can't drill down into the nitty gritty without the star of the show, can we? If I'm in the dark, she's the light. If I'm Megan and Harry, she's William and Kate. And if I'm Asia's 50 best, she's a Michelin star. I'm talking about the Bureau Asia's content manager, Melanie Kasul. How are you, Mel? I'm good as you are, but not happy being compared to the oh. Michelin man. <laughs> Have I gained that much weight no, since our last podcast no, episode? I, no, I just mean that, you know, you're the next level. Oh. You know, you're high end. Okay. You know, high maintenance kind of thing. Vip, yeah. vip, vip, vip. Now, I don't say this facetiously though, Mel. Uh-huh. You know, I'm not trying to be cheeky because you are actually the star of this podcast. Do you know how I know that? <laughs> well, whenever I'm out and about at events and stuff like that, people always ask me about the podcast, which ah, is good. It's really okay. good. Even though I'm <laughs> trying to flog my YouTube channel and I'm trying to, you know, steer the conversation into onto the YouTube channel, they want to talk about the podcast. And then the next comment is, oh, Mal, she's so funny. You can tell she has a background in media. She has lots of energy, blah, 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 blah. Uh-huh. They really sing your praises. Ah, uh, well. What can I say? I'm a natural. Get out of it. Then <laughs> they must sense my disdain and go on and tell me about, um, you know, they say that you're good um, and that you <laughs> you give them most of the laughs and all that sort of stuff and, yeah. Anyway, okay. it kind of makes me feel a bit uh, crappy. Don't worry about it. It'll rub off on you soon <laughs> enough. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we got up to a few things over the past couple of months. Back in June, we popped across the border to Cambodia. Seems such a long was time it, ago. <laughs> yeah, it's was already it, August. <laughs> was it as good for you as it was for me? Uh, <laughs> look. It's not the Paris of the Orient. <laughs> I mean, so don't expect any gushing oohs and ahs from me, you know. <laughs> Just honest reviews here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now that's been established. Overall, I'm glad I was able to see some parts of Cambodia that I haven't been before, yep. like Korong Island yep. and Kampot. Um, We weren't looking for a five-star vacation anyway, but at the same time, we're not 20-something year olds. So, you know, (laughs) we're not, we're not fine with sleeping in tent hostels or just drinking, drinking cheap beer either. I don't mind that. That's all right. (laughs) So my overall experience with Cambodia can be summed up with the... Three and a half star okay, over that's not five. Too, that's not too bad. Yeah. Look, my highlights were that one perfect day, remember? 
at the five mile yeah. beach in Korong yeah, and then it just suddenly rained the yeah. next couple of nights we were there. So yeah. that was a really but good when day. But it, when it did rain during the day, it just sort of blew in and then blew yeah, over yeah, yeah. and then Similar sunny skies to again. Vietnam. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Absolutely stunning. And yep. then we went on to visit the old cinema hotel in Kampot, yep. which, you know, if anybody wants to know, I wish that we discovered it so that we could have stayed there instead. Yeah, beautiful. And yep. then I guess the three night stay at the Plantation Urban Resort and Spa in Phnom Penh, we didn't go to the spa, but we did spend a lot of time <laughs> in the swimming pool. Yeah, the pool was really good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was nice. I'm sure people hearing this would say, eh, you should have gone to this and well, did that. Well, that's kind blah, of what blah, I blah. got. That's the next bit. Um, <laughs> a few videos came out of that trip. So yeah. um, if you're listening and you didn't know already, there's a YouTube channel. So just search at the Bureau Asia on YouTube. And I think I put out about four video, four yeah. sort of longer form videos and we then a handful a short. of shorts. Yeah. 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 And the, the main blockbuster, Mel, was titled Why I Won't Be Returning to Cambodia Anytime Soon. Look, we are never going to please everyone, especially people who are not from the same demographics or <laughs> lived experience as us. Yeah. You know, even neutral countries these days will, with all the wokeness and stuff struggle with making both sides of the coin happy. Yeah, so, yeah. but one thing is for sure, our reviews are as honest as you can get. Well, it. we try. I, I tried on this video too. Mm. Yeah, I tried because I don't know if we're going to get into that uh, further on into the episode, but I decided from the very beginning that I didn't want to spend too much time on a video, to be honest, because it was your birthday as well. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to be worried about too much uh, um, working you know, to camera Quote sort unquote. of stuff. Yeah. So I just carried my little Osmo action around with yep. me everywhere I went. I ended up having about, by the end of the trip, 600 clips Ran out of, of, of space, yeah, actually. Yeah. But I also decided that I just wanted it to be honest about our experience. And um, look, if... You go to the YouTube channel and check out that video, why I won't be returning to Cambodia anytime soon. You'll see what I'm talking about. There's a few comments, quite a few comments in there who, um, yeah, what, they range from you're a crybaby. Wow, 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 wow. You're a sook <laughs> yeah. and all that sort of thing, which is kind of like, interesting. Uh, let the immigration officer get your passport when you come back or yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's very interesting these days. If you give a review, people, people want you in videos to be honest. Same in a podcast. People want your honest opinion and your honest review of things. But when you give them one, um, <laughs> yeah, people come back at you, you know, complaining yeah. and saying things like you're a baby or you're a sook or don't come back. But I think most of those complaints are from people who are trying to make a living out Could of be. tourism in Cambodia. Yep. So they're not happy that we're, you know, nitpicking on, on, on our experience. Look, the thing is, we actually left a lot of experiences out of the video since... Yeah, we did. Yeah, since we did. And there's actually a lot of positives. Yeah. Like if people actually watch the shorts... Yeah, and nobody finished it. Yeah, I made sure that the, the shorts collection, I think there's about five short videos there. I made sure that they were all positive because there were a lot of positive things and yeah. there's a lot of things to really love about Cambodia, including the people. The people are probably the highlight, as I say in the video. So go and check it out. Um, family visits, Mel. We also had a couple of family visits. And friends as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, your nephew popped over for a few nights. He mm -hmm. was staying in Korea at the time. Yep. And uh, a friend of mine, Manchel, who lives in Sydney, she also came here right. with her daughter. Yep. 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 And my auntie and cousin visited for a few nights on their way home from France. Now, my auntie... Is uh, 80. She's 85, oh, I wow. think. So that's huge right. effort. I think they'd spent about six weeks in France. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they came over. She was very keen to catch up with me. Um, now, Mel, I've got a couple of questions for you. Okay. The first one, uh, tips for hosting family members specifically in Vietnam. Mm, well. How do you deal with it? <laughs> uh, well, if hosting in your home, like what we did with my nephew, make sure you have some creature comforts on standby because especially teenagers, uh, you'll never know if they'll adapt 
to the place comfortably and as fast. How old is he? 18? Uh, he's 20. 20. So, yeah. for example, keep some of the snacks or soda that they like in the fridge, you know? Because <laughs> especially growing young men, they love to, like, eat. They're like endless, bottomless pits. Yeah. And, you know, or a strong dose of codeine or <laughs> tramadol for the oldies uh, who yeah. may need a good night's sleep. Yeah, uh, we won't say who um, <laughs> purchased, who got high on those. Uh, anything else? Um, also, look, they are tourists. So don't feel bad if you do take them around to see just the quote unquote touristy attractions. Right. Look, if they have more time to stay, then of course. Pop them over to your local hangouts, places where you go on a daily or weekly basis, like, a, you know, your local wet market, where you actually eat pho yep. without Instagramming well, it, you uh, know? Well, I think typically the, the main reason why they visit is to see you. Yeah. Isn't it? Okay, you know, and yeah. then everything else is a bonus. So yeah. you can show them, where, like you said, where you usually hang out, like your mm-hmm. local pho place or wet market or something like that. And, uh, you know, maybe a few, um, what do you call them? Highlights like highlights yeah. popular attractions mm-hmm. in the city, you yeah. Know? So, which is what we did, you know, the war remnants. I think we went twice in about a month. the space of a month, yeah. Oh, so, a kind of war remnants museumed out. A must really visit place is the reunification palace, and don't let those other YouTubers Ooh. who are saying, Oh, the ticket is too pricey, you know, you can't put a price yeah, to I history. Can't believe people don't go in anyway. Yeah. Um, while we're at it, while we're giving shout outs, I just want to give one to the lovely couple, I hope you're listening, who approached me in the lobby of Liberty Saigon Center on Pasteur mm. Street. Um, was it last month or the month before? What are we? This is mm. August. Mm-hmm. We're recording this in the first week of August, first weekend of August. So I think it might have been the end of June, okay. possibly, or early yeah. July. Um, I was chatting to a mate of mine who happened to be visiting from Australia. On he business. Was here on business. Yeah. Yeah. And they came up to me and introduced themselves and said they loved the podcast. Ah. And, while, and while they were here, they checked out some of the places we've ah. recommended Did so far. Did they look far. for me? I'm actually, I'm not sure they mentioned you. Oh. I mentioned you <laughs> because I, we haven't done a podcast in about two months. No. And I found myself kind of apologizing to them, you know. So I was, I was like, oh, you know, we've been to Cambodia. Uh, we both got a little bit sick here mm. and there along the way. Yeah, we did. Mel went home for a couple of weeks to yeah. see family, that sort of thing. Anyway, sorry guys, I didn't catch your names. I think because I was in shock that <laughs> someone actually came up, recognized me and said, hey, we actually listened to your show. Wow. So thanks for your comments and I hope you enjoyed your stay. All right, then I guess the last one, Mel, that I want to mention before we move into this awesome episode, um, Saigon's been awarded its first ever Michelin star. So that happened while we were on our little break. In June. Um, yeah, in mm. June. There was a lot of interesting chatter about it online with two clear groups weighing in. Those who thought it was a farce, oh. like a hard farce. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I said that right. And those who celebrated it. Now, things have died down a little bit. I guess it's old news now, but worth mentioning, I think. I think we should. Well, what I just want to say is congrats to Chef Peter Kung Franklin and his Anne and the rest of the Annan crew for your well-deserved recognition. Yeah. Yep. Good on them. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll drop in a little applause just here. Um, back in June, on the topic, I threw up a poll. You threw up? <laughs> yeah. This is a really yeah. good pun for yeah. a Michelin want- segment. <laughs> yeah. um, it was in the Bureau Asia Facebook group asking, how often do you look up the Michelin Guide to select a restaurant? Mm. And we got 109 votes, which is pretty good for us. Yeah. Um, often these polls flop ah, yeah. like a souffle. Yeah. No, well... The result said, insert drum roll here. Okay, here it is. Um, 84% said never, and the next highest on 9% was sometimes. I think I voted never checked. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. I don't know. Is it still a book or is there it just is a website? There is a hard these copy days? book, right. yes. Okay. I think well, they gave that out during the, uh, the celebrations, yeah. Yeah. But it's mostly online now. Well, obviously the responses from our humble group of over two and a half thousand members don't re- represent the wider community. 
But, but they're all real. They're not they fake. Are, well, as they're far not as I fake know. followers. Yes. Last yeah. clean out I had. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but at least among those who responded to it, they overwhelmingly couldn't give a rat's ass about Michelin. Although, having said that, they felt compelled to respond, which mm. is interesting in itself, which well, is what you find in social media yeah. anyway. Well, it was a hot topic. So, yeah. you know, their, their fingers were hot to the... <laughs> but, you know, for me, I just couldn't believe that some of those establishments made it to the list while others didn't. Mm. I, I'm not talking about the winners. I'm talking about the ones that were mentioned in the first uh, book about Vietnam. And look, I can confidently say that living here in Ho Chi Minh City for as long as I have, I'm not going to talk about Hanoi. I'm just talking about Ho Chi Minh City. Look, I've been to most places that deserve to be on that list, but they weren't. And there were some that were like, yeah, really? So. Yeah, well, I I think in time, in time, you know, things will improve perhaps, Mm -hmm. but overall, I think it's a good thing. Anyway, the written responses were also a mixed bag. This is Mm. back to our Facebook group with Dave saying he uses TripAdvisor. Jason said, after seeing the selections for Vietnam, never. Oh, wow. Will and Matthew, not me, both said they sometimes use it when they travel. And Brandon said he couldn't care less about Michelin rankings. Mm. I guess the question to you is, Mel, what's wrong with having Michelin in Vietnam? Oh, for me, nothing wrong with it. I mean, that's my opinion. I'm all for putting Vietnam or any other country on the globe out there <laughs> for, you know, the fine dining map. Yeah. Just make sure your map is correct and you put those islands in the right place, okay? So you don't oh, get yeah. cancelled by oh, like yes. Barbie, you know. Great but, tip. <laughs> but like any other listing organization, um, the rules I don't understand. Maybe a bit sketchy, and the judges. Well, you never know their affiliations, credibility, and neutrality oh, for that going? matter. Okay, we better cut you off here. Well, Mel, it's that time of the episode again where we chew over some of the things that have been going down in Saigon and Vietnam since our last episode. Okay. There's been a fair bit, so I'm just going to stick with what's been making the news this week or around this past week or so. Now, arguably the biggest news for travellers is that early in July, the National Assembly approved a government proposal to extend the validity of tourist e-visas from 30 days to 90 days, wow. effective from August 15, which Breaking is about 10 news. days yeah, away from now. It'll also allow multiple entries within the 90-day period without applicants having to go through the process of obtaining a new visa each time. Oh, oh they just missed the European summer season. <laughs> but anyway, better late than yeah, never. Yeah, we've missed that season. Yeah, so there's always a- Christmas. Yeah. In addition, the list of nationalities permitted to obtain e-visas has been extended to 80 countries. I guess my question for you, Mel, is will the extension help Vietnam compete with other countries in the region as a tourist destination? For example, Thailand, Singapore and Indonesia. Uh, Yes and no. I mean, visas are not the only reason people would want to travel to a country. And say if a tourist can stay longer, you know, they might just visit the country from top to bottom and then never come back. Mm. So that's not good. Or or never leave. (laughs) (laughs) Look, (laughs) Ken. Stop looking at me. (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. I don't know how many, I guess we're thinking of backpackers here because typically backpackers have the time to travel Mm -hmm. for longer than a month, Mm -hmm. don't they? But, and maybe who else? Retirees? Um, I'm not too sure. So, well, you yeah. know, who's most likely to benefit from these changes? Okay, backpackers, yes. Oh, what about adventure travelers? Yeah, that's a good one. You know, yeah. they they're the ones on the motorbikes. Yeah, yeah. so that'll YouTubers. They, yeah, they need to go around the country longer, I guess. Yeah, you probably. I've never done um, Vietnam from top to bottom or whatever. Ah. but you would need. I mean, on a motorbike. Yep. I haven't done. I've I've done it on a bus mm. years ago. But I would imagine that these days I would need more than a month 
to to ride Vietnam from top to bottom okay. and to see the places that I want to see. It'll probably be two months or three months, I mm, reckon. So mm. it'll be great for for those, as you say, adventure travellers. Mm-hmm. Okay, the second one, unfriendly Vietnamese. Oh, is there such a thing? <laughs> oh, come on. An article caught my eye this week called The welcome that tourists do not receive in Vietnam. Mm. It was an opinion piece in VN Express, an online, well, if you want to call it news, site here in Vietnam that focused on how the people in popular tourist destinations that the writer has been to Mm. are friendly and enthusiastic and offer proper services. Now, before you jump down my throat, Mel, and Mm -hmm. you listening, The author was a Vietnamese woman. Okay. So what did she say? Okay. Well, she mentions how at Charles de Gaulle Airport um, in Paris, Mm -hmm. I guess, uh, there are signs saying things like Paris loves you and that a young random French customs officer smiled. Was he winking? (laughs) When looking at her passport and said, Xin chào, bang co quam. Oh, Which is really? basically, hello, how are you in Vietnamese? Oh, well, I'll top you that. Uh, I had a random immigration officer from Shanockville come up to me real close oh, and yeah. whispered. Where, where was I? Oh, you were getting your oh, $30 right. dollar I visa. I forgot that I had to get a visa. <laughs> yeah. yeah so, I landed and went, yeah. oh, <laughs> shit, I need a visa. Anyway, so while you were um, organizing your visa, as an ASEAN passport holder, I could just go in, oh, right? Listen yeah. To you, ASEAN yeah. passport holder. Wow. So he came up really close to me and said, Hey, give me a tip. Tip? Does he speak what? Italian? No. I was trying to trump the Charles de Gaulle airport customs <laughs> right. by giving somebody an Italian accent. Didn't work. But yeah, how about that? <laughs> yeah, interesting contrast, isn't it? Yeah. Go to Par- go to France and uh, you get a sign that says Paris loves you. Uh-huh. Go to Cambodia. Give me a tip. Like, yeah, Give me a tip, lady. We love lady. your cash. Yep. Uh, she also mentions her visits to Japan and Korea. Wow. Um, yeah, this chick must have cash. Is she a travel influencer? Uh, no idea. Okay. Uh, She writes for VN Express, I think. All right. Um, And she was impressed by how professional customs officers are Mm. and praises the availability of multilingual resources for travellers. And a lot of bowing, I thought. (laughs) Then she bags out Vietnam and goes on to bitch about how airports here aren't like that and that people here in certain positions at airports are just not that friendly. Okay. So um, what have your experiences been like here lately and how have they compared to Mm. other countries in the region you've traveled to recently like Cambodia you've just mentioned a little bit there (laughs) and the Philippines for example where you're from um look I think a lot of the times when we land into um Tansonyat airport I just really want to get out of it so (laughs) whether or not somebody smiles at me or okay it'll be nice if somebody helped with the bags because I am fairly small and, you know, I'm carrying like a big bag or a bunch of bags. So that kind of courtesy would be nice. But I just noticed that they don't look at you. There's no eye contact. I think they don't. And I'm talking about um, officers in general, security guards, staff, ground crew. They just don't want to have eye contact with you. For some reason, maybe they don't want to like you to ask a question or for that um, you know, customer staff relationship to go any further. Um, anyway, Probably a language thing as well. True, but in the Philippines, well, you would know this because you're always with me coming home <laughs> to my hometown for Christmas. You know, travelers are greeted by seasonal music. You know, from, <laughs> from our September, own- <laughs> isn't it? No, when's, when's Christmas start in? So it'll be in September. September. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the band, the Rondalia band at the airport is like, you know, November, December. Yeah. So they're smack there near the, the baggage claim area. So, hey, we Filipinos now, to you know, we know how to give y'all a warm welcome. Yeah. So come on over and love Philippines. The, the- Although... I, I really don't like that tourism tagline. So. Oh, yeah. We won't get into that one on, at no, this point. No, no, no. Um, actually, for you, it's yeah. not necessarily the greeting at the airport. It's the departure that can be the issue for yes, OFWs. Yes, yes. Uh, for an overseas, overseas Filipino, Filipino worker. Yep. Yeah. But look, 
Um, in contrast, the immigration officers for OFWs, if you have your paperwork correct and legal, they they just yep. that's it. They wave you away. Well, I guess the other questions are: Do you think the Vietnamese are actually unfriendly? And is that what lies at the core of why Vietnam has a low traveler return rate? Apparently, it does have a low traveler return rate. I can. The only way I can, well, I can't even really verify this, mm. but it, they, it constantly comes up in newspaper reports and at events, travel events. Okay. You know, back in 2019, it was reported that the tourism return rate in Vietnam was 5%. So only 5% of travelers will come back. Okay. Who have been here. In comparison to Thailand's 50%. So yeah, I don't know how accurate those numbers are, but I keep hearing this that the return rate is very low. Once people, let's say, tick off Vietnam, off their bucket list, they never come back. Well, if you're a YouTuber, <laughs> you would. You, it would be interesting to know if any of those YouTubers do come back to Vietnam because most of them are saying, oh, everyone's so friendly. Some of them do. They're so them do. nice. So uh, The ones that come up on my feed, okay, they've uh, been a here. lot of them return. Okay. Yeah, because they're living regionally, so... Mm. Look, but in terms of the regular tourist, uh, what, I, what, why, what's causing this low return rate in, from what you can gather? Well, I return here because I work here. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not sure I want to answer that question. I might get stopped at the immigration next time <laughs> I come around. All right. <laughs> Okay, so let's move to number three, which is about a matchmaker in Singapore mm. connecting Vietnamese women with Singaporean men. Okay. So this one got sent to me by Andy, our ex-co-host. <laughs> Remember him? Why is his algorithm giving him that, I, <laughs> I don't wonder? Know. I don't know how it popped up on his Hi, feed. Hi, Andy. Um, but it was a video posted by the South China Morning Post mm. called The Matchmaker of Singapore about a Taiwanese man matching unlucky in love Singaporean men mm. with, dare I say, desperate Vietnamese women. Wait a minute. What's the age range we're talking about here, though? <laughs> um, it's... it's <laughs> I don't know, does age matter? It's a little bit like size, Mel. No, but why Why would it be, quote unquote, desperate Vietnamese women? Um, like, because they're like the leftover women of <laughs> I China? No, I yeah. don't think... No, like I above don't. 30? Uh, according to the video, I was. Yeah. Uh, there yeah. were a couple of uh, ladies there and they seemed pleasant enough to me and... No, age-wise. Probably, uh, probably 30? 30s. Yeah, okay. Okay, All right. past that sort of cutoff. okay. No, I just Date, needed context. Age or okay. whatever. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the main man in the 17-minute mini doco is called Mark, a Taiwan native who runs an establishment called True Love Vietnam Brides International Matchmaker. Yes, that's its registered name and claims to have arranged more than 1,000 marriages between Vietnamese women and Singaporean men. Yet another successful business made on the backs of people hustling. Well, awesome. someone's making money on their backs. Uh, <laughs> human, human trafficking gets briefly mentioned in the video oh, okay. when the producer asks what Mark's response is to people comparing what he does to human trafficking. Oh, serious? Okay. Yeah, so he dismisses it and says there's no no comparison because I quote, this is not me. Okay. okay. This is Mark. Human trafficking is just like how white people used to go to Africa and capture black slaves. He can't say no, but we can say no. We can choose. Further, he says, how is that trafficking saying that makes no logical sense? So I knew that this story was coming up on our, on our podcast. So I looked up his business registration. Oh. It's been up since 2016 with an address at Orchard Road, Singapore. Ah. And this entity's principal <laughs> activity reads, I and I, I quote. Can I, I'll put in some sort of lovey yeah. kind of music in the background here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> friendship, matchmaking, and dating services with friendship. Matchmaking and dating services as the secondary activity. <laughs> I mean... To be fair, his business registration clearly states 
friendship twice. Mm. So, as and is the primary activity. Well, I guess he's <laughs> not. I'm you know, he, he's he not going to write put, pimp, is okay, he, on his no, business license? But you know, he didn't put illegal marriage. <laughs> mo- you know, broker. Yeah. All yeah, right. Okay. Um, it's an. Of course, he's not going to say it's, it's not about human trafficking. It's a. It's an interesting little doco. It's only about. 17 to 20 minutes long. Mm. Um, and, of course, it's nothing new to us, this topic. The Vietnamese bride trade to Korea has been well documented for years. A study back in 2018 found out, found out that almost 17,000 foreign – sorry, let me say that again. A study back in 2018 found that out of almost 17,000 foreign brides in Korea – Vietnamese brides accounted for just over 6,000 of them. Mm. So what's that? Almost half? Yeah. Almost half of them. Mel, perhaps my only criticism of this video is its title. Perhaps they could have been a bit more creative with it and called it The Deepest Breath or 90 Day Fiancé La. Mm. I wonder what his divorce rates are or if he pays his taxes. Okay, number four, moving on. Kids learning to swim. Drownings account for 2,000 deaths of children each year in Vietnam. How come all your news articles are really depressing? Oh, well, this is the dark uh, Saigon Uh, episode. All right. But this one is a little bit uplifting. I I mean, the previous one is a little bit uplifting. (laughs) Okay. All right. Um, now this one's Friendship. From a, this yes. one's from a short video by Vietnamnews.vn. It caught my eye in the past week. So just outside of Hanoi is a is an area called Ba Vi. Mm. And there's been a new mobile pool that's been oh. built and it gives students cheap swimming lessons. So a school there did some fundraising in the school community to build this pool, oh, which cool. looks a lot like those Clark. Yep. Remember the in above the 80s, ground that yeah. we had them in the eighties? Yep. Yeah, but my much bigger. Mm. Um, and the response has been huge. It's been making a splash, I suppose <laughs> you could say. Okay. According to the school's principal, she says 300 children signed up for the first swimming lessons wow. once the pool was ready to get to go, including students from other schools. Wow. wow. You know, that's a great example of how the government, yeah, totally. businesses yep. and school communities are working together to improve yeah. things for the kids. Yep. It's an awesome initiative and it's timely, especially mm. as toychairnews.vn in an article of theirs reported recently that drownings kill approximately 2,000 children each year in mm, Vietnam. I can, can believe you believe that. it? I can. Uh, making it a nation with one of the highest child drowning rates in the world, although that's said to be trending downwards. Well, that's which good. Is a good sign. Yeah. Look, I'm not a strong uh, swimmer, and you know, I didn't really properly learn how to swim until I was an adult. But yeah, obviously, Vietnam has what more than two thousand kilometers yeah, of coastline, right. yeah. and that is a threat, you know, to people who can't not swim. Not to mention the Mekong. Oh yeah. Uh, waterways, uh, canals, yeah, yeah. Uh, estuaries, and um, monsoon. Oh, you know, of course, everything fills up during the monsoon. Yeah, yeah, so many kids drown in inland waterways each year yep. while playing or by accident. Yeah. Anyway, the future's looking much better. Um, I've noticed more kids and adults taking swimming lessons. Oh over yeah, the here years. near yeah, our pool, the pool yeah. that I go to. Plus, Vietnam has a pretty strong national swimming team, along with a growing number of triathlon events up and down the country. But more people than not can't swim still. So we're still working towards getting more people swimming than cannot. Also, I just want to give a shout out to my friend We, who recently swam nonstop for 23 hours and in that time swam a distance of 53 kilometres for Operation Smile Vietnam, an organisation that operates on children born with cleft palates. Amazing. Clap, Uh, clap, clap. Yeah, we is next level when it comes to swimming. A number of years back, he swam around the island of Phuc Quoc. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, they tell me it's about the size of Singapore and it took him about a week to (gasps) do it. Yep. Um, He also, one Sunday, packed the swimmers – 
and went down to Vungtau, from where he proceeded to swim about 21 kilometres or so to Lom Hai, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway. La, I'll la, 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 just a crazy, normal Sunday. Um, I'll leave a link to his pages in the episode description if you're interested in checking out the incredible feats he gets up to in the water and if you want to learn more about uh, what's Operation happening. Operation Smile yeah, Vietnam. That's right. And finally, Mel, to wrap up this awesome new segment, number five, um, curry. Mm. Curry was found in Vietnam just the other week, Mel, from 2,000 years (gasps) ago. Wow. Yeah, a scientific paper published in the middle of July has revealed that the earliest evidence of curry in Southeast Asia has been unearthed (laughs) (laughs) in southern Vietnam at the Ao archaeological site down there which was essentially a trading port during the Funan era around 2,000 years ago. Hey, yeah, I read about this. Exciting. Archaeologists have discovered what plant remains from the grinding surface of stone tools, right? Thought to be of South Asian origin that include um, things like uh, Turmeric. Turmeric. I can How never say Turmeric, I think. The yellow yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Ginger, finger root. I don't know what a finger root is. <laughs> oh, my God. Sand it's, ginger. Maybe someone just threw that in there. No, galangal. Yep, galangal. Yep. Clove, nutmeg, and cinnamon. So these are spices used in the making of curry in South Asia and, today. And in Vietnam today. We yes. still have uh, Vietnamese cuisine has a curry, mm. uh, typically just called Curry ga. Curry ga. ga and is chicken. All those spices in their fa broth, you know, yeah. makes sense yep. that, that and we have it. And yeah. stuff like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. The paper goes on to suggest that South Asian migrants or visitors introduced this culinary tradition to Southeast Asia during the period of early trade contact via the Indian Ocean, commencing about 2,000 years ago. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. I'm not surprised, though, after the small amount of reading I've done about the location which for a time was part of the Champa Empire, Mm. populated by the Chums, who are believed to be heirs of the seafaring Austronesian peoples originating from Taiwan and Borneo, Mm. probably your ancestors, Mel. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ever want to get stuck down a rabbit hole, then this might be a good start. And one place to start is by visiting the Museum of Vietnamese History here in Saigon near the zoo. So you can go into the zoo gates there. It's excellent and will give you a grounding in the eras of Vietnamese history and peoples. I thought you said grinding, like (laughs) grinding spices. As regular listeners would know, I'm on a mission to get 1,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel by Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Which technically in the Philippines, that's next month, yep, September. September. And in order to do that, there are a couple of things I need to do in order for that to happen. And they are to publish quality videos okay, and publish regularly, which I'm finding is much, much easier. Easier said than done. No, your videos are your videos are always quality. It's the, you know, it's the regular. Oh, thanks, Mel. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard the, to get yeah. them out if you if you're trying to produce what you think is quality. Mm. It takes longer, and it for me it takes me a long time to to you know I need yeah. a series of videos done so then I can release them okay. over a period of time. Exciting stuff. Yeah. Now I have a long list of video ideas in order to achieve my goal. And in fact, just last week I completed one of the videos I had on the list called Dark Saigon. The idea behind it was to introduce viewers to 10 locations in Saigon that are dark. Mm. Essentially where some pretty bad shit has happened throughout the city's history. Both in modern and colonial times, yep. right? Yep. Okay. Anyway, long story short, as I got closer to finishing the edit of the video, I began to realise that it had morphed into something a bit bigger and a bit more serious than a simple 10 best list. It was really touching on some sensitive topics, that is war stuff. And given that just last week on the 27th was the War Invalids and Martyrs Day, I had a rethink and thought it best not to publish. So... 
in all likelihood, that video will never see the light of day. It will stay hidden in the dark. Yeah, (laughs) I just didn't think it would be appropriate. Okay, fair enough. Um, But it all hasn't gone to waste. There were locations in the video that would be completely fine for me to feature. Mm -hmm. So instead, in this segment, we're going to introduce five locations that are perfectly fine for us to reveal and are, in fact, for the most part, Places that all Vietnamese would like foreigners to visit and learn more about Vietnam's history and culture. All right, let's count them down. Okay, so number one is perhaps Saigon's most authentic and quite possibly darkest French colonial era sites. It's called the Chan Phu Memorial Museum. Chan Phu was the Indochina Communist Party's first secretary general back in the early 1900s. And it's named after him because he was incarcerated and died at this very site at just 27 years of age. 27? Yep. Wow. It's so amazing, you know, how young these heroes are, you know, at 27. (laughs) Yeah. Some young people these days are obsessed with memorizing dance moves on TikTok. Yep. Meanwhile, you've got somebody like Tran Fu who was, you know, making... Making history. The building initially was a ward of what is now called the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in District 5, which is in fact the city's oldest hospital. Oh, it's I still didn't operating. Know that. Yeah. In the 1800s, it started out as a treatment centre for infectious diseases, then began to specialise in mental illness. What that means specifically, I don't know. I don't know how they treated uh, it back then. Look, I'm assuming in those days, if sicknesses cannot be diagnosed properly, they assume it's just all in the mind. Yeah, right. Okay, but then, as what often happened in the early 1900s, opposition to French rule intensified. So Mm. the French needed more places to hold the growing number of political prisoners of the time. Mm -hmm. So it was converted into a jail for men, women and children. Oh, all together? Uh, There's There's sections. It's a small, it's all under the one roof. Okay. uh, But there's a male section and then the women and children Children. are at the front. Wow, I've never been to this place before. It's definitely one of those places I'd love to see. Is it? You've been to the hospital. Ah, to the mental health. Yes, to yeah. get the... Um, when we got married, we had yeah, to... Yeah, uh, we had to get a... Uh, before we got married. Yeah, a check. <laughs> a right? check, That's yeah. right. Is it easy to drop in or you have to make an appointment? Uh, you need to make an appointment. So I'll put the details or uh, how can people contact me? They can contact me through... Only fans? Email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be appropriate for this. <laughs> uh, I'll leave some kind of contact for this so that if you're planning on coming to Saigon anytime soon, uh, you can reach out and we can get it organized. Okay, number two. This one is just simply an extremely moving place to visit given what took place here. It's called the Tuk Wang Du Memorial and it's located at a very busy intersection in District 3 where the event took place in 1963. Mm, I know this place and been there a few times, not just riding past, but actually going down and checking out that little park there. So the name Quang Duk may not be familiar to many of our listeners, but he's the Buddhist monk who self immolated in protests of the Diem government. That's right. Long story short, Ngo Dinh Diem was the president of South Vietnam at the time, and he was a staunch Catholic who was seen to be favouring Catholics over the rest of the population, which was majority Buddhist. Mm. So on June 11 of 1963, Buddhists in Saigon joined a procession through the streets of the city to protest And Wang Duk, who was a high-ranking monk, when he arrived at the intersection, he got out of a car with two other monks. One placed a cushion in the centre of the intersection for him to sit on, while the other one poured a jerry can of petrol over Wang Duk and then left him to strike a match when he was ready. Yeah, I believe that this is one of the key moments that opened the eyes of the world to what was going on at that time in Vietnam. Yeah, very powerful stuff. Okay, number three, Bot Ye Te. Now, this one is just dark. There's no other way to describe it. And you would really have to have a keen interest in the history of Vietnam, particularly the French colonial era history of Vietnam, which is relatively recent to visit this place. It's a small complex in District 9, about 15 kilometres from the city centre. And as I said, it's called Bot Ye Te. 
Oh, I haven't heard of this before. Is it like a museum or just a... It's been converted into a kind of a museum, oh. yeah. It was built about 100 years ago and started out as a French radio communication station, which is how it gets its name. Yatep, I believe, means telegraph wire. Mm. However, in the mid-40s, it was converted into a police station and came under the command of a clearly very evil French lieutenant and an equally psychopathic deputy who earned the nickname Evil Beard because of the torture the pair began meeting out at the station. Wow, talk about a notorious tag team. Very dark indeed. It's said that between 1946 and 1947, 700 Vietnamese political prisoners were tortured and killed here after being hunted down in the outlying areas. That's so terrible. Just within a span of a year. Yep. Nearly twice, like there's what, 365 days in a yep. year and they had like 700 yep. there? <gasps> Some truly evil shit went on there. And to this day, many of the implements and a couple of cellars are on display, mm. like down underneath the building, which might sound morbid, but it helps you get a better idea of the depravity that went on in this place. Okay, now lovers of true crime, Mel, might get a kick out of this one. Okay. Although the location where this event took place has nothing to indicate that anything actually went down there. It's oh. really just an interesting story. No evidence. <laughs> no. Yeah. This location, just two kilometres from the city centre, was instrumental in the downfall of Saigon underworld kingpin Num Gum, known as the godfather of Saigon who reigned throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s as the most notorious mob boss <gasps> in all of Vietnam. Don't tell me, was his undoing <laughs> a woman? You got it, yeah. <laughs> but the shit hit the fan when female rival Yung Ha from Haiphong up north came to town exploring potential opportunities oh. and even a potential partnership with Num Gum in a business sense. Okay. As is how these things usually end up, Mel. She copped a bullet to the head. <gasps> I don't mean to laugh, but, mm. you know, they're gangsters at point-blank range by a couple of Num Gum's underlings before they spin off mm. to the north. Wow, this sounds like the most modern one from your list, you know, the stuff urban legends are made yep. of, but this one's real, right? Yeah, it happened. Oh, yeah, I wish just, there was a Netflix movie. Yep, it could, this. it'd be, it'd be really <gasps> be good. Amazing. Um, and uh, if anyone's interested in actually watching a little bit, um, go to the YouTube channel. I've got some shorts on this sort of stuff. So yep, better than Netflix, the, the YouTube Asia. shorts. Yeah. Anyway, eventually the trail led to Num Gum, resulting in one of the largest criminal trials in Vietnam's history, which led to the death sentence for him and his accomplices by firing squad a few years later, bringing to an end one of the longest running and most powerful criminal organizations in history. Wow, and justice prevails until another mobster rises up the ranks. That is Dark Saigon. That's cute, bitch. Everybody and the mom do music. And finally, we have a mummy for you. So to wrap up this short list is the Som Kai mummy. Cheers for a well-preserved pun at the very end. <laughs> yes, yeah, Saigon has a mummy and you can go and see it too. Back in 1994, construction workers were digging up a plot of land in the Som Kai neighbourhood oh. of District 5, oh, oh, an old oh. part of Chinatown. I've driven through yeah. there. When they unearthed a tomb about 60 square metres in size. Mm. Yeah. What they find? Well, inside the tomb, good question. I believe there were three coffins, but the main one held 60-year-old Chan Ti Hu, mm. who's believed to have died around 1869 and was embalmed and buried with various artefacts, as was the custom for people of an aristocratic class at the time. So what was with her, like uh, You can find out. You can find out. You can view oh. the mummy. You can view Chan Ti Hu at the Museum of History adjacent to the zoo. Um, but keep in mind, it's closed on Mondays. Good tip. Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give it a like, share and comment and feel free to ask any questions related to Vietnam and the region 
on the Bureau Asia's social media channels at the Bureau Asia, and I'll do my best to answer them. Mel, as usual, thanks for joining me again. That's no problem. Uh, is there anything coming up that travellers must check out if they make it to Ho Chi Minh City in the near future? Yes, coming up soon at the Bureau Asia Only Fans. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Okay, I've, that's the first I've heard of this. Okay, so we better wrap it up. That's it for this episode. Don't forget to send in your comments and questions before our next episode so we can comment and answer. Until then, take care and stay safe. This is Matt Cowan. And Melanie Kasul. Enjoy your week wherever you are. Bye.